un placer estar con todos vosotros. Eh, tengo el honor y el placer de servir como decano de EGAD Business School y de la Escuela de Negocios del Tecnológico de Monterrey. Quería daros la bienvenida eh, como moderador, ese va a ser mi rol, a este panel eh, How the Power of Purpose, How Conscious Business Can Shape the World After COVID-19. Eh, tenemos con nosotros pues, una mezcla magnífica de expertos, de industriales y de académicos, y aquí es donde voy a switch al inglés. So, we have with us uh, three colleagues, three friends. Uh, let me start with uh, Russ Sisodia. Russ is professor at Babson College and visiting professor at Tecnológico de Monterrey. He's one of the co-founders of the Conscious Capitalism Movement. We have from the industry uh, our friend uh, Eduardo Garza, Lalo Garza Tejunco. Uh, Lalo is the chairman of the board at Frisa. And uh, we also have the pleasure of having with us Eugenio uh, Clarion Rangel. Eugenio is the chairman and CEO at Grupo Cuprum. And let me do a short introduction before I, I hand over to, to our three panelists today. We've been listening a lot in the last uh, couple of years and building a what i believe is a very solid uh, momentum around the notion that corporations should do something else than making money and definitely profitability is at the core of the equation and it's extremely important for for corporations and uh, what we have today uh, in front of us uh, is um, crisis probably without any precedent in recent or past history is uh, bringing more attention to the equation. We have on one side the pressure from the business side of um, industries, um, big challenges, small and medium-sized firms, family companies affected today, and probably with a much larger uh, impact in the near future. We will see these uh, projections from uh, capital market experts on, on how the economy is going to be impacted. And uh, on the other hand, what we see today in our day to day are beautiful and um, extraordinary examples of companies that are illustrating this belief that we all serve that business should be a force of good. And um, these companies, by individual or collective action, are reinforcing uh, the validity of things we've been hearing in the last uh, year the business roundtable statement uh, in Mexico, uh, the statement. Uh, of a large group of um, businessmen in the Consejo Económico Empresarial. And we see companies supporting their employees, their customers, their suppliers, their communities. And today, Banco Santander was announcing that they are quitting their dividend and they will devote these 90,000 um, million euros, not a small amount, into credits for SMEs. We see the Johnson & Johnson, Pisco & Google giving away free technology. Uh, and a lot of uh, examples here in Mexico. So this is what we have today. This is what we are facing. And um, I was getting a question this morning on how long this is going to last. The best answer I have is we don't know, but uh, we know that we will come as a different world after this. So let me get into, into the questions for, for our panelists. And let me start with Rash Sisodia. Rash, my first question to you is, uh, when this crisis ends, and we don't know when, again, um, probably we'll see that leaders need to be different, act different, and have a different vision when conducting business. What are your thoughts and, and uh, ideas on this, uh, Rush? And I don't know if we have a rush. Uh, yes, now I'm unmuted. Oh. Okay, now I'm okay? Yes, now I'm still muted, no. Now you can hear me, right? Yeah, so thank you uh, uh, for organizing this. I'm very happy to be with all of you uh, today and to share what we uh, understand and what we expect and hope and learn from each other. You know, I do believe that uh, this is a, of course, as you said, I don't think anybody alive on the planet has experienced anything at a global level of what we're going through right now. So this is truly a, an extremely uh, rare kind of an experience that we're having. And it's like, it's like all of society has had a heart attack, you know, 
and we're in intensive care. And I think what, what it takes to come out of that really is intensive caring. So this is a time for us to care and share, care for each other and share in the pain. This is not a time when we can expect some people to bear most of the pain. A lot of, already a lot of people are, those who are obviously uh, getting infected directly and losing loved ones uh, to it. But I think we have to share uh, in that suffering and be there for each other. And I think, uh, you know, as you said, there are a lot of beautiful examples of leaders and companies that are stepping up and doing things that in ordinary times, uh, you know, it's rare to see those kinds of actions. And so I think this is awakening us to the fact that we are all deeply vulnerable as human beings. And we don't realize that when times are good, we're always vulnerable, but except, especially now, this becomes so evident to us. Our vulnerability is what defines us as human beings. It also today in this moment is what unites us because we're all in this together. It doesn't matter you're rich or powerful, you are not protected from uh, from this possibility. So I think leaders who are going through this and they are opening their heart and their compassion is awakened and they are seeing the suffering of others and recognizing that everybody matters and everybody needs to be helped. I think that that will result in a fundamental shift in their consciousness. That I don't think you can go back, you know, and close your heart. You can't go back and unlearn what you have learned here. So I believe coming out of this that there will be a new normal that will be much more deeply rooted in our collective well-being, making sure, of course, that we are prepared better next time for something like this, but also changing the way I think that we operate uh, overall. So I'll, I'll stop here. I'm sure we'll come back to these themes, but I, I do believe that this is, you know, this is not a U-turn. You know, this will be kind of a one-way road that we are on right now. And I think it's, it's bringing us to a tipping point all the things that happened last year were more words from the Business Roundtable and others, uh, BlackRock, etc. I mean, there was action to some degree, but I think this is now a moment of truth when words become action. And I think the heartening thing, uh, positive thing we're experiencing is that more companies than not are in fact stepping up in, in quite a beautiful way. So uh, I think there's room for uh, optimism on that front. Thanks, Russ. Uh, we will come back. Uh you. Russ um, has been working with Tecnológico de Monterrey and the business school for over a couple of years now and we're very lucky to, to have him and, and, and this has become one of the um, uh, probably more strategic discipline areas for us at Tec de Monterrey. I mean how do we make our companies more conscious and how do we um, support from a company perspective not only profitability which of course counts a lot but also employees and communities and the planet and the well-being of everyone. Let me move a little bit to, to the industry. Um, both Lalo and, and Eugenio are also supporting um, a center that we launched in from Tech Monterrey, which is a center on conscious business, and they've been part of the discussion here. So you, you guys have a large responsibility um, leading your organizations, two large Mexican organizations, quite exemplary. And what we're looking now as employees, as part of organizations, uh, is for leadership and ways to engage ourselves more than ever today. What are the challenges that you, uh, from your both uh, organizations, are facing today in management of your employees and and other stakeholders during this current crisis? And maybe this is a question for both of you. Maybe Lalo, you wanna jump in first? Yes, uh, thank you, Ignacio. Uh, I think so if we look at the things short term, it's been very difficult for us to balance, you know, how we take care of uh, the internal, you know, health, well-being of the people and at the same, taking, same time taking care of the business. So it is a very difficult uh, thing to gauge because, of course, we don't know exactly what will happen and what will not happen depending on our actions. No? So I think one of the challenges as business uh, that we face right now is trying to understand the trade-offs between taking care of our people and taking care of our business at the same time. And, of course, taking care of the business, we have to do it also thinking of our people in the long term. No? So I think that's, that's one of the challenges. I, I was listening to a video of a good friend uh, Dr. Adis is recently, and he was comparing, Russia's compared this to a heart attack. Uh, he compared the situation to war, but he was, he was saying that it's like being in war, but being in retreat, not being in attack. 
And usually, while you're in retreat, everybody thinks for themselves. You know, you kind of save your own life first, right? And I think that's that's the feeling that we have as business people. You, you, your first, your first gut reaction is how do you save yourself? But but the reality is right now more than ever we need to be thinking how do we save as much as we can, you know, short term and long. No, so I think you know balancing those trade offs and thinking, you know, kind of not going to the first natural reaction, which is you know going internally and just think of your company, your people, but also being able to have the energy to think outside uh, and just not only for ourselves. No? So that's, that's what comes to mind, a little bit of the trade-offs, you know, taking care of the business, taking care of our people, and at the same time, how this uh, crisis tends to make us naturally take care of our own first, uh, which is a tough position to be in. No? Thank you, Lalo. Eugenio, yes. what are your views? Thank you. Um, I will add to what Lalo just mentioned and uh, share a little bit about what we have been doing in, in Cuprum. Two years ago, we started with a conscious culture uh, program and actually it all started thanks to Rash, who uh, I attended a conference uh, that he gave to my group and, and, and it really came to my mind and my heart, the importance of culture in companies. And we adapt this, uh, what is called the conscious capitalism, where you try to balance between all stakeholders. Uh, usually we always think only on shareholders, but it, under this concept, employees, customers, suppliers, the community and the environment come into place besides the shareholders. It's easy to say that you have to satisfy all these stakeholders, but it's very difficult to do it in an equal manner. And in this time, more than ever, uh, under an unprecedented crisis with an all, a, a great uncertainty because we, we really don't know how hard this will hit our businesses and how long it will last. So uh, for me, it has been a challenge on this last week to make sure that we balance between all these stakeholders. But of course, the first thing we have put in front is our people. We created our purpose and we developed a culture with a leadership, very strong leadership team that helped me to develop values, principles, and many different uh, things that it's easy to put it on a blackboard, but it's very difficult to live on them. So right now the big challenge is we're putting the health of our people as the first priority, but then it comes also as uh, Eduardo was saying, that you also have to take care of the business. You have to make sure the business will survive in the short and medium and long term. So right now we have implemented a lot of different initiatives in order to make sure that first, our people will be safe. Second, we will continue supplying our customers, which are really the guys that will maintain our business going, but we also need to take care of our suppliers and our shareholders and make sure the business has the liquidity or an, and the cash flow to be sustainable in and after the pandemic. And of course, getting out of this stronger, uh, but especially conserving all the talent that, that's something very important. The last thing that we will do in Cuprum is lay off our people. We will do, of course, some salary cuts. I am putting on the table that I will be only receiving half of my salary for the next three months and the rest of my team in a different scale will be also putting money in order to make sure we don't lay off people and that again employees 
will maintain and we can get out of this pandemia stronger than before. Sí. Gracias, uh, Eugenio, for this first uh, set of ideas. We'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, we go back to Rush, and we were talking about leadership um, before. Let me be a bit more specific and, and gain your opinion. Uh, I mean, today we are all leaders and we are all soldiers. And then this is how we're going to beat this, uh, this COVID and, and, and gain this war. But we are all sort of scrambling and Eugenio and um, Eduardo mentioned to secure supplies, keep all our employees on board, uh, motivate them, uh, push them to, to, to remain healthy and, and safe. Uh, what could be in your opinion, and we are only a few weeks into this pandemia, the key learnings as of the moment for leaders in terms of um, agility, humility, compassion, and transparency. What are the key learnings and what is it still to come in terms of changing the way uh, we as leaders uh, behave? Thank you, Raj. Yes, so I think some of the things that have already been uh, exemplified, I think, by Eugenio and Eduardo, uh, you know, leaders, you know, there's a good book by Simon Sinek called Leaders Eat Last, right? So it's basically the idea that we have to do everything we can to take care of our people and we have to share in that sacrifice. So I think that's something that leaders certainly have to demonstrate. I think it calls for an extreme level of communication, constant communication and transparency uh, with all stakeholders uh, so that they know uh, what the situation is and uh, what we're trying to do uh, so that they're not shocked or surprised when something uh, you know has to be done. I think the other thing also is that we tap into the collective wisdom of our uh, stakeholders. In other words, it's not just that all the ideas and solutions have to come from the office of the CEO, uh, that we can ask for uh, for help and ask for suggestions. And you know, there's a lot of creativity out there in terms of what can be done to help the business survive, you know, how we can reduce costs, how people can help each other, and what mechanisms that uh, we can uh, set up for those kinds of things to happen. So I think it's going to take, and you know, and, and at some point, you know, being honest with people that, they, you know, is as both of them have pointed out, both the leaders have said, your duty is to the people certainly, uh, but also to the survival of the business because in the long term, you know, it could be a temporary furlough that you do. And of course that's better than a layoff. Furlough basically says you still have your job, but just no salary, basically it's leave without pay. Um, but, if you cannot do the things that will protect the business's ability to continue to function and then come back, then of course those jobs are lost forever. You know, So those tough decisions, I think, are already being made and, and many more lie ahead. And I think people understand that but, uh, to the extent possible. And I don't know in Mexico how much, like here there's a $2 trillion <clears throat> government rescue package and there's some support there and unemployment insurance uh, and other, uh, you know, things that the government is able to provide. My guess is that in many other countries, uh, certainly in India and Mexico, you know, where the government is not such a rich country, there's not that much of a safety net provided by the government. So the pressure on business becomes even greater in that sense. You know, my friend Danny Meyer, uh, who runs Union Square Hospitality Group in New York, had to lay off 85% of his uh, people. Uh, you know, he runs some upscale restaurants there. He said revenue has gone to zero essentially, and uh, and he said I have to do that, and if that way they are eligible to get an insurance, uh, ins uh, unemployment uh, insurance, right? So again, it's a kind of difficult but loving decisions that are going to have to be made. But as long as people see that we are trying everything possible before that is done, that we are communicating with honesty and transparency about uh, about what is going on, that we are open to all suggestions and we're looking to involve everybody. It's all a collective journey, it's a family. Uh, and uh, that we share the pain, you know, uh, together. And that's, I think, pretty important that everybody has to see that it's not just being born by, you know, a small group of people. So I think those are, there are no easy answers to that question. I think leaders are human beings like everybody else and they're under enormous pressure and there's never been a more difficult time. 
to be a leader, the burdens uh, that uh, that are upon you are, are great. I also think that leaders need to uh, take care of themselves through this time. I do worry about the health and the sort of extreme stress levels of my friends who are leaders. And I say, you know, you, you it's like putting on your oxygen mask. You have to do what you need to do. You know, self-care is not selfish. It's a generous thing if you take care of yourself because so many people are dependent upon upon your ability to function at a, at a, at a high level, you know, so. And I think then also learning from each other and, and uh, not just from people within the company, but leaders, I think, generally out there. Uh, there's an interesting website, Just Capital has a resource. Uh, just Capital has, uh, if you go and search on their website, they've got uh, the 100 largest employers in the U.S. and what each of those companies is doing right now. You know, all the different dimensions, you know, what they're doing with employees, suppliers, uh, etc. So I think there's a lot of ideas out there that, uh, that we can gain from as well. Thank you, Raz. You open up a good point in um, looking at what the U.S. government is doing, launching this three trillion U.S. dollar support fund, and and trying to cover, you know, with a larger unemployment uh, policy. And yesterday, it was like eight million people already filing for for this unemployment um, uh, safety net. Definitely, uh, th this is happening in different speeds in the world. You know, we see the European Union not being very coherent and cohesive and, and leading more to different nationalities to take measures. Uh, you mentioned India, <coughs> Mexico. Mexico, I believe we're waiting for the largest announcement that will take place uh, this Sunday. But I want to ask uh, both uh, Eduardo and, and Eugenio a combined question. One. What is the best practice or what is uh, sort of shocking you in a positive way of what you are seeing in other companies in Mexico, small or, or large companies? What are they doing to cope with this situation? And the second one, what are you expecting from this uh, private-public cooperation, public meaning the government uh, in Mexico? And, and what is next for, for our country in this sense? Maybe Eugenio, you can jump on now first. Yes, of course. Um, well, to be honest, uh, I personally don't expect too much help from the government. I'm part of the uh, board of CONCAMIN. CONCAMIN is la Confederación de Cámaras Industriales, where, where all industrial chambers are affiliated. And although there was a meeting last day, um, it seems that it's not going to be a, a, a great announcement what the president will deliver on Sunday. I hope I, I am wrong because definitely all the uh, micro, small and medium sized companies will definitely suffer. Some of those are actually uh, my customers. Uh, most of the aluminum that we supply through our stores for windows and doors are uh, fabricated and installed by these small uh, companies. So I do hope that the package has some reliefs because definitely compared to other countries, our government is doing absolutely nothing. And it's not understanding that without jobs, there will be no money to get for the poor and there will be more poor people and then a social crisis and, on, and more uh, on safety. So it is a pity, but uh, on the same hand, I think that being as uh, we try to be conscious leaders, we have to uh, reflect and forget about the government and do whatever we need to do to try to help. And that's why one of the reasons I don't want to lay off anybody. Uh, in Cuprum, we have about 6,500 people. So it's, it's a huge amount of people that I hope we can maintain. Uh, and that will, as I mentioned before, uh, will be the last thing we will do. Uh, but as uh, Rash was saying, uh, the business has to survive. We need to make sure that we come out of this uh, with certain um, 
minimum uh, result and be able to continue growing and, and, and improving. Uh, I think this is something that will make us stronger as leaders. We should understand a lot about this unprecedented and uh, I, I'm sure that this will demonstrate how good leaders we are. And just my last comment is we as leaders should maintain very healthy, mainly mentally and physically, because we need to be strong and lead our people and help our people to motivate them to do their best under this very difficult circumstance. Thank you. Thank you, Eugenio. Um, Lalo, so, you, you want to add show, something? Yes, two, two things came to mind. You asked about what companies are doing. And one thing that, has, that I've been seeing, which is very interesting for me, is all the organizations have capabilities that we have developed in order to serve a market, to make a product. And what I'm seeing right now is how some companies are using those capabilities that were used for a product or a service, and now they're putting those capabilities at the service of the community. You see, you know, plastic injection, molding people, making masks when they were doing something else. You see companies like Tesla using their technology to, to do, uh, you know, respirators. So, and I think also that the management capabilities that we have in organizations can be put to service in a different way. So, so one thing that I've seen happening, and I think it's interesting, is what capabilities we have as organizations that we can put to use as a service for others right now, and not only to serve our, our particular customers or product. So I think that's happening here in Mexico. We're seeing people produce different things, give ideas, organize people. Uh, so I think that's, that's something very powerful. No? And, and, and I, I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of learning because we're realizing we can use our own uh, you know, strengths as a business for, for other purposes too. Uh, so I think that's very interesting. And, and to your second point about government, I, I want to, you know, I see there's more than a thousand people watching and I want to make an invitation to everybody. Uh, right now, I think is not the time to think what's fair or not fair. Uh, you know, we could think, is it fair for the government not to support? Is it fair that some companies are in a very difficult situation and some, some are less? I think we need to think what's possible, not what's fair. And in this time of crisis, we need to kind of open a, par a parenthesis and change of paradigm and think of what's possible and see how we can make things happen and forget about what it can or cannot be fair between organizations, between government, between society, you know, because it's, it's, a, it's a difficult time. And, and I, I really have been thinking about that. I think our, our paradigm of what's fair or not has to change. Uh, and perhaps as Raj was saying earlier, we will learn many things if we do that. Uh, because I think right now we just have to focus on what we can do and, and who can do it and who has the better position to do it. Uh, and, and hopefully we can get through like that. Thank you, Lalo. That is a great thought. Um, I don't think this situation is fair for anyone, but this is what we got. And uh, we got to navigate through this and, and try to, to make the best out of the situation and diminish the impact, uh, especially when we talk about business. How do we, you know, support uh, employees, uh, SMEs, all these uh, 95 percent of uh, the, the gross national product in Mexico coming from small and, and family business? This is our job, and, and that was my question about how we cooperate better, the public and the private. Um, let me go back to Russ. Russ, uh, we belong to universities. We've been with Babson for for uh, a long time now. Mm. I take them on the way. We've been taking some decisions uh, throughout the crisis in the last uh, few weeks. And we believe as universities, we do have a distinguished role in, in supporting and, and going through, through this crisis. Um, probably moving our lines um, two weeks ago was a big move for, for technology in Montreal and other universities in, in the world. Uh, what we see, and what I'm seeing at least uh, myself, is that we will emerge as different institutions. Probably education will never be the same as uh, we left it four weeks ago in a face-to-face -face campus format. Uh, what are you uh, seeing uh, around the BAPS or the Ivy League uh, universities? And how do you think we will come out 
as universities and educational institutions of this uh, COVID thing. Yeah, it's uh, certainly a lot of learning going on, a lot of experimentation. There are a lot of people who were comfortable using some of these technologies, many who were not, but they're having to get up to speed very quickly. Uh, I think we are learning what works well uh, in that uh, uh, modality. Uh, and also I think we will, when we come out of this, learn what are the types of uh, learning experiences that having in-person proximity is important, right? So we can better use the technology, of course, to become more efficient, uh, to make our, uh, to make education more accessible, more affordable to more people, which is a big problem uh, everywhere, especially in the US. Uh, but also, as I said, learning what are the kinds of experiences that, that really do require us to be present. So I think we will appreciate the human presence being together, which we take for granted always. I think we will appreciate that more, but we will also, I think, be further on that learning curve of what technology can do. And I think a lot of new innovations uh, are happening in the technological realm, right? Uh, we will figure out to make it even more uh, like telepresence, right? That you're that you're really there. There are a lot of tools that we can use that are actually better than what we're able to do. So I just think, like in every, you know, even all the people working from home uh, for companies, uh, companies will discover a better way to be and pr provide their people with more flexibility. I remember years ago when uh, when telecommuting became a possibility with technology and fax machines and computers and so forth a while back. You know, some companies said, okay, well, we'll take 30% of our people and just put them at home all the time. And others will continue to uh, come to the office. And what they found after a while is initially people were excited, but then they, they were missing the social connection. The workplace is also a place where we go and have uh, interactions with our colleagues and friends, and there's a whole social dimension to that. So it became then kind of a way to uh, dehumanize the work experience for those people who were feeling isolated. So ultimately, the better way for it uh, that some companies discovered was let everybody have that flexibility so you can work at home two, three days a week if, if your job allows it and you also are free to come in. And I think we'll figure out how to do that, but it will ultimately make things more efficient. Uh, there'll be fewer people on the roads, fewer commuters. Maybe we don't need as much office space, as much air conditioning, et cetera. And, we still, and maybe it's better for our children that we can be around more. Right, so I think it'll it'll uh, it's kind of it's developing. You know, there's a lot of new muscles that are being built up now. You know, that we have never used before, and we will be able to then use those in a thoughtful way in the future and rethink. You know, I think part of what's going to happen is that we're going to re rearchitect the way we teach, the way we learn, the way we work, uh, etc., and do it in a way that's win-win. That's good for people. It's good for their families. It's good for the environment. It's good for the business and we are eliminating uh, wasteful uh, expenditures of, of time and money uh, and, and effort right, in doing that and then come up with a more optimal way that we use uh, those resources going forward. But again, like with anything, you know, we have to be all be in that mode of not desperately trying to go back to business as usual. You know, we just want normalcy. No, I think there's an opportunity. I mean, every crisis, the Chinese expression for crisis, you may have heard the same symbol represents opportunity as represents crisis. And it's hard to feel that way in the middle of it. Uh, but we know that this will end. We know that this is not going to go on forever, obviously. It's going to go on for a certain number of months. The recovery from it, I was reading Lawrence Summers, uh, who worked in the uh, Obama administration, was president at Harvard, an economist, very famous, well-known economist. And his analysis, he said, I believe my expectation is that, that we come out of this quickly. You know, as long as we can keep certain fundamental, uh, you know, uh, institutions intact and, and companies, you know, are sort of on idling mode, but not shutting down. He like he lives on Cape Cod, and he said every you know every at the end of summer Cape Cod empties out and all the people go away and it's like you know suddenly you've gone from 100 down to 15, and 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 then every you know spring it comes back you know he said I think it could be like that, there'll be a lot of pent up demand, uh, you know so our, our recovery I think should be rapid and and, uh, and 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 robust, we just have to get through the interim in a way, and, and I think the other thing, a point I did want to make is, 
you know, people have long memories and people will remember what companies did. And I think conscious companies like the ones that are represented here and many that we work with are stepping up in a beautiful way and people have gratitude and there's, there's sort of a bond, emotional bonding and connection that's deepening with all stakeholders. But by the same token, on the other side, if, you know, if people don't show up in this moment of need and crisis, if people act in a way that is seen as uncaring and selfish, you know, and, uh, and myopic, then I think that will be remembered. You know, it's like a forest fire happens, you know, a lot of the things get eliminated in that. I think companies that are uncaring, uh, you know, and, uh, and unconscious, I don't think will survive as well as the others in the long run, because there will be, as I said, a consequence. You know? Hopefully there, there, there will be a lesson and, uh, and some learning from us as uh, human beings and definitely as consumers for those who step up and those who didn't. And, and I think we are, I'm, I'm writing down practices of companies I'm not liking. And, you know, once we're done with these things, probably uh, as individuals, we will take some actions here. Uh, okay, we have something like uh, 1,200 uh, attendees to, to this uh, EGADE webinar. This is our fifth webinar. Um, keep posted, there will come more after Easter break. I have one final question for, well, from my side, and then we'll take a couple of Q&A from the audience if you guys agree. One final question for uh, our businessmen, our conscious businessmen, Lalo and, and Eugenio. And, and it's about Mexico and what we're facing ahead. And also I've been reading a lot of um, different um, articles and, and, and different experts, some of them from EGAD and Technological Monterey, pointing out that from an economic perspective, what's happening in the world can bring some good opportunities to Mexico, especially around the supply chain and the diminishing the, the, the positioning of the Chinese uh, producers. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think some additional manufacturing opportunities will come to Mexico? Will that be enough to get into this V type of uh, recovery that some part of the world is predicting out of COVID? What are your thoughts on this? Maybe so Lalo? Yes, well, I mean, uh, at least uh, sharing my experience, we are seeing this regionalization already. I mean, uh, we, we serve the North American market very much. And what we've been seeing this year is, uh, I don't know if we should judge it as good or bad, but what we are seeing as a reality is that, uh, you know, companies are tending to try to want to stay close to home. So I think uh, thinking of Mexico, it definitely will present an opportunity uh, because of the fact that uh, specifically North America in looking at supply chains in, in, in Europe or, or Asia has been difficult. No? So, I mean, the short answer for me is yes, I think we will have opportunities uh, from a Mexico perspective. And I think the opportunity will be mainly, you know, uh, Canada and, and the US looking to, you know, consolidate supply chains in the region. I mean, yes, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, opportunities will flourish. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how much time it will take to get uh, on a very deep uh, problem for many companies in such a way that these opportunities are so good that we can take advantage of, on that and especially how strong our financial position will be to take advantage on, on that. Uh, my company about 70% uh, depends on Mexico. Uh, the rest it's uh, US, Canada and some other countries but we mainly operating in, in the NAFTA region. Uh, although there are some um, companies in Mexico that indirectly um, export our products, uh, they depend also on the economic situation of Mexico. So I'm sure we will find a lot of opportunities in Mexico. We just need to make sure the right time to go after those. 
uh, because as you mentioned at the very beginning, the main thing is that we don't know how long this will last and, and the full effect. Um, and uh, that's why being a conscious business, we need to make sure we are prepared once this goes away, because I'm sure it's, it's gonna go away and that we will have opportunities. Uh, for sure, my team is very committed. We are all hands-on looking daily on how to act and how to improve. And uh, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, putting our people in the front line. So I, I do think there will be opportunities. I'm not sure the best timing on when to get those in-house. Thank you, gracias, um, Eugenio. We're gonna move now to um, some questions that were posted by our participants. I mean, difficult to, to select very many great questions, so pick up a few of them and, um, and maybe I will follow the same strategy. I will ask you uh, to give your opinion on that. There was one that I was curious about, Rush, um, and the question was something like, I mean, we've been moving through a much more uh, purpose-oriented uh, um, business all over the world, uh, of course, in some geographies with much more impact. Uh, is the COVID an opportunity or is going to be sort of, a, is going to damage this moving to what some of you are calling a stakeholder capitalism? What is your view on this? Oh, I think if we actually <laughs> stay true to uh, what we believe and truly have purpose, stakeholder, leadership, culture, you know, all of those elements in place, I think uh, it, will, it will strengthen us. Uh, it will strengthen us as a company because, you know, very often what happens, companies go on this journey and a lot of employees and others are waiting and to pass judgment. So is it real, right? Because people can be sometimes cynical or they don't, you know, they have trusted in the past and, uh, and had a negative experience. So sometimes like I wrote a book, Everybody Matters with Bob Chapman and until the 2008 financial crisis came, many of their people were kind of stay, holding back and were skeptical. They said, okay, we talk about truly human leadership and, you know, we measure success by the way we touch the lives of people, but do they really mean it? And when that crisis happened and they saw the actions taken by the company and said, wow, they really do mean it, right? And and those people became passionate advocates and passionately committed to uh, to this company, you know. And so we saw a huge cultural shift in the positive direction uh, as a result of that. So I, I think the same uh, opportunity exists over here. Competitively, as I said earlier, I do think that companies that operate like this will be valued even more in the future because their actions would have demonstrated what this means uh, for people in the future. One of the things that I think has to become even more important as a priority for all businesses, including conscious businesses, is that we have to make sure that we have, we, we focus on maintaining a strong balance sheet that will give us some resilience and ability to ride out. You know, these black, this is a black swan event. Unfortunately, black swans are becoming more common, right? So we could have other pandemics. We certainly know about other global challenges that we face, climate change being the biggest of them. Uh, but but others as well, right? And we, as businesses, need to create that, that sort of stability. And, you know, unfortunately, in the U.S., that has not been the case for many, many public companies. Because in the last 12 years or so, companies have spent 90 to 110% of their profits on share buybacks and dividends. Right? I mean, literally, some years, it's more than 100%. They borrow it because money is cheap, and they can borrow that money, buy back shares, Right, so the, the debt burden is incredibly high for many of these companies and that's fine. With low interest rates, you can sustain that when revenues are coming in. But when you have this kind of an event, like all three, the biggest airlines are essentially bankrupt without a bailout. Because, you know, even when they had profits or they used all of those profits not to retire debt or, you know, build uh, sort of reserves, but, uh, but basically buy back shares. And, you know, that's a myopic action, I think. It says you don't have any growth possibilities, you have no imagination where the business can grow, and you're basically uh, dis disproportionately rewarding shareholders and executives because stock options become a lot more valuable 
it's an artificial increase of the share price without actually creating more value when you buy back shares. You know? So I think those kinds of tactics, which you can justify in the short term sometimes, just given the price of money, but I think they create a weak structure. And you know, it's our responsibility as a business to run a business that is sound and solid, right? That will not fall apart the minute a small crisis, one or two months, three months, six month crisis happens. Now, of course, we can't sustain multi-year crises. That's nobody can expect, but at least we should have that level of resilience. Thank you. It's really interesting, the example of the airlines. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, the real estates need to uh, save from bankruptcy. Uh, industries that have been buying back their own shares. Uh, this is a discussion for another panel, I believe. Uh, let me move into a little more Mexican um, scenario. Eduardo and um, Elano, uh, sorry, and Eugenio, it's going to be a bit provoking question. It was on the list of Q&As. Uh, talking about the three trillion uh, funding of uh, this crisis from the U.S. government and similar practices in Europe and you know, large, uh, very powerful economies. In Mexico, we will have 50 percent of the population living under, you know, what the United Nations declare at, uh, as poor, and we have something like 58 percent of the workforce working uh, as informal. Huh? with no contract, then what can we do from established companies and organizations to support all these people? That is going to be the, the, the ones that suffer the most, the impact, today's impact of uh, COVID and, and any recession that comes uh, after that. What are your thoughts on how do we support as a nation all these Maybe Eugenio and Eduardo, and uh, we'll ask you for some brief answers so we can get a couple more questions from the audience. Yes, well, from a standpoint, uh, uh, the best way is to maintain our uh, people paying salaries and uh, making them um, part of the company to get a, a continue having a job. Um, I think that uh, we can do and help uh, on some uh, other ideas that are uh, going on to, to help uh, some uh, associations and organizations, uh, non-for-profit that are also working into how to help uh, on this pandemic, but uh, our main responsibility is how to be able to continue uh, paying our workers and employees, and at the same time, uh, having a financial sound company that will come up out of this stronger without losing our culture, our values, uh, and taking care, of course, of our different stakeholders. One big uh, problem is that under these extreme circumstances, you just think about the short term and forget about culture and all that you have been constructing since the past. And, and, and there is a big temptation to forget about that. And, and I think that we should be always, of course, attending the urgent things of the day, but at the same time, not forgetting about the mid and long-term uh, situation of the company and maintaining our culture efforts and helping people cope with this extreme uh, difficult time. And, and, as, and again, I don't think we will get any help from the government. I hope I, I am wrong and that uh, some of these small businesses do get some relief because otherwise the uh, economic downturn will be much deeper than what anybody has been predicting up to today. So, Ignacio, Any additional thoughts? Yeah, to compliment uh, Eugenio, Ignacio, I, I, two things come to mind. 
So the, what's happening in the, in the rich world, at the end of the day, the governments are bringing money from the future to the present. And uh, they're going to be dead and they're going to have to pay it somehow. So I think the first idea is we need to bring money from the future somehow. Uh, we can do it, but we, hopefully the government does it, but we can do it in organizations. So an example for us, uh, for example, we, our foundation, we decided to bring the sourcing that we will have next year to today. And we will figure out what to do next year, but we can do that. As, as, as people, you know, there's an effort to, to pay some, uh, you know, everybody in the restaurant business, you know, we will spend money in the future. Can we spend it today? So we need to try to bring money somehow that we will eventually spend to keep money flowing in companies, in families, uh, etc. So that's one idea. Uh, hopefully the government can do some of that. Of course, we will not be able to do it as much as uh, France or US or Italy, uh, but I think there's no other way. We have to bring money somehow to the, to the community and it has to come from two places. One is the future and number two, I think there's no space for luxury. Uh, now is the time to be frugal. Now is the time to be austero, you know, and, and uh, and between those two things, that, that can help somehow, no? We, we need to bring money that, is, that we will spend in the future, and we have no space for luxury. We have to focus on what's necessary, and we have to focus on everybody. And I think that's, that's the only thing we can do. Again, I don't know if it's fair or not, but that's what's possible. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, Lalo, let me launch one last question. We have five minutes to go, and I need one minute to wrap up, and thank you guys. Uh, for being with us today. So Raj, I raised you one question that um, was talking about the skills and the, 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 the competencies that the leaders or the new leaders that the world will require, government, business, society, uh, after COVID, what are the three things that uh, you believe they will require the most as skills or competencies? I think, you know, I mean, we need the conscious leaders who are a blend of strength, you know, which is courage, discipline, focus, resilience, all of that, with a tremendous degree of love and compassion in their heart. Uh, I think that combination is extremely important. You know, one of the the one of the book I'm working on now, we're calling it the wise fool of tough love. That the ideal conscious leader, ideal leader, really is somebody who blends these four human energies there's wisdom which you know is kind of elder energy understanding meaning and purpose and legacy and uh, impact beyond our lifetime there is the uh, sort of joy of, of a child you know which we call the foolishness with you know with, with which comes creativity with which comes humor and fun and all of that you know leaders have to have that we need to uplift people and show them joy and positivity etc et as well uh, so there's wise and foolish and you need to be tough and you need to be loving. Martin Luther King said we must be tough minded and tender hearted. So that's the masculine and feminine. So we need a blend of the healthy fa father energy, healthy mother energy, healthy elder and healthy child energy, all of that together. So I think that kind of leadership is what's needed at a political level and in business and every, every aspect. Right? Because those are the f positive sort of healthy uh, human energies that defines what it is to be a whole person. And we can cultivate those, by the way. You don't have to be born that way. You know, you can learn how to be that. We're writing down that to bring it into, into our skill uh, learning model at the Tech de Monterrey and Agade. And I fully agree that would be really necessary, uh, not, not only today, but in the near future. Let me uh, finish, Russ, and apologies. I'm going to switch into Spanish for, for the closing and the thanking you guys. Uh, me muevo al español, como ven, mi español es eh, con un acento de saltillo importante, según dicen mis alumnos. Eh, primero quería agradecer a pues, todos vosotros que habéis estado ahí acompañándonos en este quinto webinar eh, que alrededor de temas de liderazgo eh, y de COVID, pues desde GADE Business School y desde el Tecnológico de Monterrey estamos ofreciendo todos los lunes, todos los miércoles y todos los viernes de 1 a 2 de la tarde, 1 to 2 p.m. Eh, la semana que viene paramos, eh, creo que, que todos requerimos también pues hacer 
eh, otro tipo de cosas y cultivar mucho nuestra, nuestra salud mental y estar con la familia, pero volvemos en dos semanas. Eh, y hoy es un, un, un tópico, pues, eh, evidentemente nos es muy cercano al tecnológico, <coughs> perdón, nos es muy cercano a la escuela de negocios, nos es muy cercano a EGADE, como este es el mundo de eh, cómo hacemos que nuestras empresas sean más conscientes y por esto entendemos pues, que tengan un impacto no solamente económico y en la búsqueda de rentabilidad, sino también en otros stakeholders en nuestra sociedad. Hemos visto hay magníficos ejemplos en Frisa, en Cucrum, pues de cómo cuidar eh, eh, a los empleados de una organización, de cómo poner el foco en que los proveedores en momentos turbulentos y, y muy complicados pues, se sientan arropados, nuestras comunidades, el planeta. Eso es lo que nosotros entendemos por pues, el nuevo normal de las empresas. Y para cerrar, pues muy alineado con lo que nos han eh, expuesto Eugenio, Lalo y Ras, nosotros creemos y yo personalmente creo que este cisne negro nos va a traer una magnífica oportunidad de hacernos mejores como seres humanos, con un propósito mucho más rotundo eh, y con mucho más impacto, y también de hacernos mejores como organizaciones y tener esa visión mucho más integral pues, de cómo hacer el bien, por supuesto, cuidando nuestra actividad económica y nuestra rentabilidad. Os deseo a todos pues, eh, mucha salud. Os pedimos mucha responsabilidad, eh, quedaros en casa en la medida de lo posible. Eh, juntos vamos a navegar por, por estas turbulentas aguas y, como antes he dicho, estamos convencidos de que vamos a salir mucho mejor de lo que entramos. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos, Rush, eh, Lalo, eh, Eugenio. Un placer y un lujo escucharos, eh, entender vuestras opiniones y cómo estáis apoyando en un momento como el eh, como actual. Uh, and Russell, forward to, to keep up uh, our work after Easter. Muchas gracias a todos, que estén muy bien y seguimos. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Gracias a todos. Saludos. Okay. Plus, thank you. Uh, take a lot of care. Stay well. See you soon. Gracias, Ignacio. Thank you. Oye, gracias, eh, Lalo. Eugenio. Un placer, eh. Buenísimo. Gracias. Hasta luego.